Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, this afternoon, for the last conversation around the film program titled The Body Undone, A Conversation with Loss. Uh, today, we're speaking with filmmakers Madonna Adib and Carol Nguyen. I'm so grateful and happy that they both could join us, as well as indebted to them for sharing their riveting short films, Let My Body Speak and No Crying at the Dinner Table. I hope the participants uh, had the chance to watch these films that were online until four o'clock today. Uh, my name is Sana and I have curated the film program for the Embodied Arts Festival hosted by Oyun Berlin. Um, before diving into the conversation with the filmmakers, I wanted to um, give a bit of context to the film program um, and the films that are part of The Body Undone, A Conversation with Loss. Um, for me, this program has um, really been a journey of sort of self-reflection on trying to understand what the ideas of embodiment and memory mean to me outside of inherited ideas and to discern for myself and for my own body what embodied memory feels like in my body. Um, it hasn't been an easy process, um, but I've been very grateful uh, through my research to have watched films which allow me the space and time to acknowledge the feelings and emotions that have come up during this process. Um, I began my reflections on embodied memories, um, looking at the works of a poet uh, by the name of Meena Kandasamy, and she's from India, the writings of the American author, Christina Crosby, and a queer Indian artist uh, by the name of Balbi Krishnan. And uh, I specifically wanted to look at the emotions of loss and grief. Um, their work, uh, along with the selected films in the program, helped me map new areas of inquiry and pose questions that were away from um, sort of the conventional outlook on the linear notions of losses predestined path, uh, especially in a culture that is frantic for uh, resolution. Uh, and instead, I wanted to look at loss as holding social, political, and aesthetic implications for the body. A loss that doesn't um, rely on the linearity of time, but that is very uh, profound, intimate, uh, from the deep spaces of oneself. And I then wondered that from this position of embodied knowing, uh, whether we can re-engage with loss and that re-engagement could generate sites for memory and history and the rewriting of the past and the reimagining of the future. And could this engagement with loss, the irrecoverable, uh, somehow paradoxically become a condition of new anti-colonial hope and agency? Um, I focused on storytelling from new voices, especially those of women, and uh, most of the films look at various sorts of losses held by different bodies. And I hope they've allowed the viewer to meditate on the idea of loss uh, being inseparable from what finally remains. Um, this conversation is being streamed live via Oyun's uh, YouTube, Facebook, and Vimeo channel. So for all of the participants who are joining us uh, here on Zoom, uh, please mute yourself uh, during the conversation. And if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box. And for those that are watching on the live stream, you can also send us your questions via chat. Um, I will begin by introducing Madonna Adib, the director and writer of Let My Body Speak. Madonna Adib uh, was born in Damascus, Syria in 1986 and received her BA in Fine Arts from the University of Damascus in 2008 and a BA in Film Animation at Congotia University in 2012. She creates experimental documentaries which have screened internationally in festivals and art museums. Her work revolves around LGBTQ plus rights, identity, and migration. She is one of the six founders and photographer in the project Syrian Eyes of the World. In 2016, she worked as a photographer with the Canadian National Board of Fil Film Board, sorry, for a film shot in Beirut about the Syrian refugee crisis. Currently, she has two films in development, a short fiction about the LGBTQ community at the beginning of the Syrian revolution, 
and a feature documentary about four Syrian women who leave their families and take off their veils. She lives in Beirut and works as a freelance writer and filmmaker. For those of you who haven't seen her film, Let My Body Speak, it is a personal and intimate journey exploring the rep repression experienced by the filmmaker during her childhood when she faced sexual control in Damascus, a city that was also experiencing a growing socio-political repression in the late 80s, early 90s. Through the creative use of family archive mixed with current footage of her own body, she reconstructs the pain of the past absorbed by her body. Let My Body Speak had its international premiere in ITFA in 2020 and has since re received the Best Arab Special Selection Award at the European Independent Film Festival. The film will also be part of Hot Dogs Film Festival this year. Uh, could the Oyun team please play the trailer of Let My Body Speak? أخذتني أمي عن طبيب نفسي قال عندي ستريس لما سافرت صار جسدي هو أرضي الوحيدة هو الشيء الوحيد يلي بملكه صرت في جنب النساء يلي بحبون Uh, my other guest today is Carol Nguyen, uh, who's a 23-year-old Vietnamese-Canadian filmmaker based in Toronto and Montreal. Her films often explore the subjects of cultural identity, family, and memory. Filmed as part of her film studies at Concordia University, her most recent film, uh, No Crying at the Dinner Table, premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival and had its international premiere at ITFA in 2019 where she was additionally invited as the opening night speaker. In 2020, No Crying at the Dinner Table also received the jury prize for short documentary at South by Southwest. Carol is a 2018 Sundance Ignite Fellow, Adobe Creativity Scholar, and a TIFF Share Her Journey Ambassador, where she strives to empower diverse voices and women through her own stories and personal experiences in the film industry. Over her last several films, such as Every Grain of Rice, Tundra, Facade, and This Home is Not Empty, Nguyen has been finding new ways, whether experimental, dreamlike, or indirect, of cinematically reckoning with family dynamics and the real weight of living through one's own history. Currently, Carol is working towards developing her first documentary feature, as well as an animated short. For those of you who haven't seen Carol's short film, um, it is a heart-wrenching, cathartic piece where the filmmaker interviews her own family to craft an emotional, complex, and meticulously composed portrait of intergenerational trauma, grief, and secrets about things left unsaid. 
the film is a striking depiction of what families avoid discussing and what can happen when those taboos dissolve. Could the Oyun team please show the trailer of Carol's film? Hương Vai xin muốn chơi kênh trước view của mẹ Vai Thị Hiếu lại So just nghe and về thôi Um, so both your films are, I mean, very distinct in form, style, and context, yet um, connecting them are these very personal, layered, and raw accounts of your own families, their histories, uh, your memories, identity, belonging. And um, what I found was also this idea of how can you navigate through these emotions um, and find spaces of sort of acknowledgement of everything that comes up when it concerns the past. Uh, there is a strong physicality and emotion in how we remember our memories. And um, it comes through so beautifully in both your films. Uh, for me personally, watching both your films, it was um, sort of a sense of release within my own body. I had to sigh many times and I felt like there was a lot of things that I was able to let go of. Um, so I want to begin by thanking you for making um, not only really beautiful work, but personal stories that matter. Uh, welcome to this and um, conversation. How are you guys doing? Where are you? What are you up to in these crazy times? Madonna, how are you doing? Hey, I'm good. How are you? I'm okay. And you, Carol? I'm doing well in Montreal right now. Everything's going well. Given the pandemic as well? Given the pandemic, we're in our third lockdown. So mm. we'll see where this goes. And you, Madonna, in Beirut, which more than the pandemic, there's other things as well happening. Exactly. <laughs> this, is, this is the last thing we were thinking about. <laughs> After yeah. the Beirut explosion, nothing matters. So no, it's, it's uh, summer here. Yesterday I was on the beach. It's cool. <laughs> oh, I'm jealous. Yeah, I, I saw you in your little tank top and I was already like me and Carol in our sweatshirts here. Um, it takes a real courage to, you know, shoot a film about yourself and uh, your family. Um, the stories are very personal, yet at the same time, the topics that you've touched upon, I think, can resonate with people around the world. Um, I want to start this conversation talking about the genesis of your project and how you decided to tell these very personal stories. Carol, do you wanna go? Sure. So this was a third year university film and um, going into the school year, I thought I was gonna make a fiction film. Mm. Um, and I had originally planned a story about a three generation family. And through the fiction film, we discover how love assimilates through mm. each generation. And so while I was doing my research and approaching my family, asking them about how they felt living in a three generation household, I discovered their stories. And they were stories I'd never heard before. 
and stories that resonated with me very deeply because I had also had a traumatic experience that I had not shared with them that I thought it was just um, a, a, a single experience mm. for me. But that's when I learned it was a, a, a collective experience and something that we had been conditioned to do through our family and perhaps through cultures and sometimes immigrant families where language becomes a barrier and also culture becomes a barrier. And sometimes um, things such as crying can be seen as negative. Mm. Um, And that pulled me back to my memories of when I was a child and my mom always telling me, you know, no crying at the dinner table. But if you want to cry, you go to your room, but eat all my food first, (laughs) because that would be offensive (laughs) to leave uneaten food at the dinner table. Mm. And so I had then approached my family about this film and they agreed Um, without any hesitation. um, My family's been in several of my films before, even when I was in high school. So to them, it was... um, they were used to the cameras, they were used to the film set experience. Um, and they were, they had a relationship with me as a director. So, um, and that was basically the, the seedling of No Crying. And did your, uh, the statement that your mother made when you were upset of No Crying at the dinner table, uh, did that just directly come to you when you were thinking of the title of, for the film? Um. You know, I can't remember because it's been two, three years now since the conception of the film. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was a pretty easy process to come up with the title idea. I find that there are two films. There's Mm -hmm. like the films where I know the title right away, which Mm -hmm. was No Crying. Um, And then there are those that you have to find, you know, along the process. Um, Yeah. Okay. Madonna, what about you? What was what began this project? of deep introspection through your body for you. You're silent. (laughs) Okay, thank you. Uh, Well, it all started as a personal need to tell what happened in the past. And then I started realizing how much we need to talk about such subjects that are considered taboo in this, mm. in, in our region specifically. Uh, and then also seeing the consequences of all this secrecy on my personal life, on my body, on other friends. So, and then I started also seeing, or I, th- I started thinking that it's it's a need to, st- to stop normalizing social oppression and stop t- taking it as a sacred tradition that is saving society. We also uh, need to be aware uh, about how it's linked to the political oppression. So mm-hmm. I, I thought that, yeah, I'm gonna start from myself because this is the only way, this is the only thing I'm sure about. Mm-hmm. So I started digging in the archive of the family and the re-remembering mm-hmm. uh, the mental health problems I, uh, problems I had that I wasn't aware of, uh, remembering all the details, all the bullying I was, I was facing without mm. knowing. And yeah, I got there. It was a natural and, process. And the title? Okay, title <laughs> of my friends usually come, comes at the end. So mm. it was also an organic thing that happened like, yeah, let my body speak actually, because I'm talking about the trauma that is uh, in my body that mm. it, so, yeah. <laughs> and do you normally begin the films by thinking about themes or does the central story come to you first? How do you go about it? Depends. Uh, okay. the, usually there's something I want to talk about. Uh, I see some scenes. I, I know what I want to talk about and then the story uh, starts to build up. Mm-hmm. And in your case, Carol, how is it themes first or central story? Um, I, I guess I began with the themes first because I didn't know that this was going to be a documentary in the first place. Mm. But the themes had shifted along the way. Um, after the three generation idea, it then began to shift to mental health. Mm. And then after the mental health idea and going through the experience, I discovered the word intergenerational trauma. Mm. So I think I started from a very big pool of ideas and then 
narrowed down to what the film really was in the end. And um, can you tell me, I mean, a bit about the team, because of course there's your family as the main characters, Carol, um, but there seems to be this camaraderie within the team, especially in the last shot, you hear more people, you come into the frame. Um, was it out of necessity, number one, to um, direct your family members as part of your film? Uh, and also, what was the dynamic like within the team that your family members were able to be so vulnerable with them? Yeah, I think, you know, this being a student film, we had to work within the restrictions that we had. Mm -hmm. So certain number of shoot days, only a certain number of days for my team to get to know my parents and my family um, and do research. So that being said, we had to make sure that the set was a safe environment for them, that only the necessary people um, who were needed for that scene were there. So after everything was shot for the interviews, it was only me and my cinematographer mm. in, the, in, the, in the set. Um, for the bigger scene, it was me, my cinematographer, and um, another camera guy, just to make sure that there were no technical problems. Um, but my family's comfort level and their safety in being vulnerable was always our priority. Mm. Um, and I, you asked another question. I'm sorry, I forgot that one. No, I also asked about um, just like the, and I think this touches upon being that it was a student film that your mm -hmm. characters ended up being your family. I mean, your mother has played and your sister, Michelle, has also been in your previous films. But I was wondering if that was like out of necessity or how did that start out? I, Directing you know, your parents. Um, for no crying, you know, once I discovered their stories, I couldn't find anyone else. These were their mm. stories. So it wasn't, it wasn't out of necessity, but it was, um, mm. it was purposeful for um no crime for every grain of rice which was a film I also made in university that was purposeful too but I think what I'm learning as I make my films with my family is why I choose to use them and I think at every step of the way I'm starting to open up with them more as a daughter mm -hmm. and as a filmmaker with no crying they didn't really understand um, the, the film until I finished it Mm. because this was kind of a message that I didn't know how to say to them that I created this experience for them to understand mm. um, for my there was a fiction film that I created called Tundra where I used mm. my mom as well but that was out of there was no other Asian Vietnamese actors um, Vietnamese middle-aged women actors for the script so I ended mm. up using my mom um, which speaks about, I think, some of the diversity issues that we have in the industry. But as I grow, I, I want to expand beyond my family. And as I create fiction films, of course, that means using actors and other people. Mm -hmm. Madonna, your work, of course, is extremely personal. You were naked in the film which you've directed, you've narrated, you've performed in it. Um, and you were naked metaphorically, but also physically, uh, very raw. Um, what, would it, what was it like for you to put a team together um, to be sensitive to your own emotions of filming your own body? Yeah, uh, that wasn't the, the easiest thing uh, to be naked metaphorically and like mm -hmm. literally. Uh, the, the team was very small, only the the OP and her mm -hmm. assistant. Um, I wanted them to be all queer and women. Mm. Uh, and yes, those are the two people. There was no sound uh, on set and that was a plus for me uh, in this, uh, this situation. Uh, being This is about being naked uh, physically. Being naked uh, metaphorically uh, was a, a big part of it. Uh, the producer, she was great, mm. uh, no way, Mandel. No, Mandel. She's mm. amazing because she, she pushed me out of my comfort zone, but with, without being uh, invasive. Mm. And that was very smart and very, there's a fine line 
between these two. So because I tend to to hide, maybe anyone would, would have done that. I tend to hide sometimes. It's uh, embarrassing sometimes. Mm. It's hard to to be that vulnerable, especially when I know that it's going to be screened in front of people. So yeah, but she she played a an amazing role with this. It wasn't easy. Yeah, it's interesting that you talk about this. That you knew that your film was, you know, both of you knew that this very private work was going to be public. Um, and this question also came up yesterday during one of the conversations with another artist um, who, whose piece was more performance based of as a filmmaker and artist, how do you sort of negotiate and navigate between the personal and the public and where do you, you know, draw the line? So Madonna, how was it for you knowing that your very, very personal life, not only your life, uh, but also your body is going to be on big screen? and what were sort of the feelings that went through it, through you? Well, there are choices, like for sure, this is not all the reality. I chose what to show and what not. Mm. Uh, I pushed myself, uh, no one helped and everything, but there are certain things that are, no, that are really uh, for myself, very personal that I hide. Mm. Uh, because, you know, I'm not like, yeah, <laughs> I'm not gonna open everything, but for sure, uh, like each time I know that this is what I want to tell, I need someone to push me more, to tell a bit more, but at the same time, yes, to hide what I really want to, to keep for myself. It's a, it's a very tricky question and it's a very tricky choice to, to, make, to make also. Yeah, as a filmmaker, I mean, it's, I mean, because your film also obviously speaks to a huge community, not only within Syria, but around the world, whether they're women, whether they're queer, and, you know, to, to, un, to know where to say, okay, this is personal and this I don't reveal to the public is, I'm sure, a very hard line. Carol, how do you nap? Sorry, go so, ahead. Yeah, just, because if I also uh, just put some things that are... Uh, that are not so personal and that are like common with everyone, it, it would have been also boring because, mm. because what am I say, telling? Because everyone knows this. What am I telling? What am I adding? Correct. Yeah, totally. Carol, how do you navigate between the personal and the public? Just like Madonna, I had to decide what I wanted to keep for myself in the edit. Mm. Um, and that's when I discovered that my film wasn't about the conversations itself, but what happens after this film. Mm. And you really don't see what happened after the conversation in the film we excluded because I decided that that is, you know, what we were here for in the mm. end. And also that was the more vulnerable part than the interviews themselves. Um, mm. Because, you know, this is the part that is totally... Uh, non-scripted and what I mean by that is you know we all knew on the day of that we were coming to set to tell a specific story and to discuss a specific thing but we didn't really know how everyone would react after that and so mm. that vulnerability I wanted to keep for my family because this is the beginning of a very long journey that we have to work on every single day um, so I think in documentary you 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 capture so many vulnerabilities, but you really have to prioritize which one is for you, which one is mm -hmm. for the public, and which one might be uh, on the verge mm -hmm. and, and why you want to place them on each category. Do they make an impact? I think we get a glimpse of that in your film in the ending scene where, you know, your sister, your mother is crying and your sister puts her arm around her and there's this really intimate scene there and um yeah there's a glimpse of you know this sort of what possibly could then the discussion go forward to within that family um and you talked about the editing process right now and I was just wondering for both of you I mean one thing is to shoot the film with really difficult topics um but then to go into the editing room and watch it and re-watch it, uh, what is that process like as a filmmaker? And how is it to you know, go over these emotions again and again? And what do you decide what to keep? Carol? <laughs> um, so our film ended up being 15 minutes, 40 seconds, I would say. 
and mm-hmm. we had five, six hours of footage. So mm-hmm. it was going through all those interviews, rewatching it, cutting down the fat, rewatching it again, and seeing what is the core of each interview, and then also finding a similar structure for all three of the interviews mm. to interweave. Um, and I think there came a time, because this film is so personal to me, that I became a little numb to the footage. Um, and trying to figure out more of the technical than the emotional aspect. And that's when we really had to find a balance about, you know, taking a break, coming back with fresh eyes, who to involve into Mm. the process, um, and who might not be so useful. So I think it's, it's a little dance and a little balance you have to play to figure out who the right partners are for the edit Um, and for us that was a lot of breaks and a lot of people who were close to us who had a technical eye for cinema um, that uh, didn't know my family that could see it from an outsider's perspective to help shape the structure of the film. Mm -hmm. Madonna how was your editing process? (laughs) Was it as difficult as the shoot? I can't even imagine. I thought the shoot was hard, but no, <laughs> it was the first few days were horrible. Sitting in a dark room with the editor and a big screen, watching yourself naked for eight hours is not fun. <laughs> and choose what you want to choose from this. Uh, first, mm. first few days were, were a bit hard, then I got used to it. Mm. Uh, so it became, yes, more technical. Mm. Uh, the archive was also hard because sometimes it's it's cringy some, in front of someone else. Sometimes it's yeah, embarrassing. So, but yeah, it's, uh, I also got used to it and started to be technical. I mean, like when I see something related to mental health, yes, now it, it, it's good with the story or not. It's, I stop seeing it as my personal story because otherwise I, I, it, it would drive me crazy. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine. Have your parents seen the film? Yeah. What, how did they respond to it? Uh, they both liked it a lot. Uh, my mother was like, oh, I didn't know mm. that these events happened. Why you didn't tell me? Uh, mm. I was, she, she, was, she apologized that she wasn't aware of everything that was happened. On, I'm like, no, you don't have to apologize. This is what you knew back then. Mm. Um, my father... He, he didn't say anything. He just, he just got sad. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it must be difficult as parents because, I mean, they definitely, there's, you know, a lot of your mother, I think, there in that, uh, especially when you talk about your stress mm. and uh, being taken to a psychiatrist and they're asking you why you're stressed and things like that. So I, w- I was just wondering how your parents responded. And of course, Carol, your parents are in the film and have probably watched it after and what was their response to it and they've also I mean your mother and sister like we've talked have been part of your films um, and kind of your you know your characters in many of your films earlier how did they respond to your film once they saw the final product Uh, my sister cried (laughs) my parents they asked to watch it again but they weren't really you know they were a part of the experience so they knew what the film would be Um, I think for them, they didn't understand the universality of their Mm. stories until the public saw it, um, until we had our premiere at TIFF and they saw, you know, physical reactions on people's faces and they're like, oh, okay, this is important. It's not just our family. Um, So they liked it and they were very proud. Yeah. And have you uh, been able to show it to more of the Asian diaspora? Uh, or even in Vietnam, for example, the film? We have, um, we're very lucky that, you know, with the pandemic, a lot of the things were online. So we were kind of able to uh, cross borders. Um, So a lot of the Asian diaspora, I I was really proud when the film premiered online and, you know, people could watch it online for free. And so I felt just so heartwarmed that, so many people could relate and see their own family and mine. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think when you talk about physical intimacy, um, actually watched your film when I first came across it and curated it, uh, watched it with a bunch of Indian uh, girlfriends. And we all resonated about this lack of physical intimacy in many of our families uh, that your mother talks about um, so beautifully uh, and so poignantly. So I think it's um, it's such a universal story and also you know brushing things under the carpet and not really discussing things that um, are essential in a family is very common to me, be the Asian diaspora. I wouldn't know if it's common in the West. Um, Madonna, what about your film? Has it been shown in Syria? <laughs> Or no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, of course not. Online, no. anyway, do, do no. people have access online? Or? No, they don't. Uh, some of them, when they ask me, I send them a private link, and some of them just attended in virtual uh, online, yeah, online group. screenings, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, there's no place anyway to screen it in Syria, and there's I don't want that to happen, especially politically also. Mm. But um, yeah, and th th yeah, they can they can have access if they go online and attend a festival or ask me personally. But otherwise, how would it be? And in Lebanon, have you shown no, the no. film? No. no, it's also the COVID had, the COVID played a big role of not showing it like in actual physical space. Mm. So but when you. It, hmm? What was sort of the response of audiences, let's say, at ITFA? Um, because you, you did show online at ITFA, correct? Yeah. Last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And did you have people from the community, like, write to you or...? Yeah, a lot, yeah. Mm. Uh, a lot of people, like, I've heard a lot of positive uh, comments. Uh, at the same time, I've had some clashes with some people who were patriarchal back then mm. and still in Syria and they were like oh you're ex exaggerating maybe you were happy this is not so true I'm like what <laughs> so they're still in denial of everything which is sad but this is why we need to keep talking about this totally um let's talk about the visual treatment of your films guys um Madonna you use some extremely of course extensive close-up shots of your family and then this combination of like archival material and images. Um, and there's also, um, you know, these screechy sounds, these repetitive sounds that are used in the film. Uh, what went behind sort of the visual treatment and the audio, la the soundscape of your film? Um, it was very essential for me to have the, my body very soft uh, with the, you know, the shooting to be very smooth and soft. Uh, to, to be a bodyscape shooting mm. because the whole idea of the film that this is my the only land that left mm. that I have and this is the only thing that I own myself and actually I re-owned it after leaving uh, so that was very essential to have it as a land very soft land and in um, um, in the contrary of having the very rough archive which mm. is rough in the content too the sound it's like that something how it's repetitive in your head mm. and also when you have ocd uh things got in loops mm. so this is the sound that is always repetitive and in loops in my head and it's very annoying and at the same time there is this the it's a, the climax of the film there is this sound of the shaving uh, machine so this is that escalates and then pop, it cuts. So mm. I wanted all these to be repetitive, 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 and mix of this shaving machine, then to cut it and to sound the sound of the nature with the body scape. Body. Mm. Yeah. And well, was this a long process to kind of figure out how you wanted to show your body and the footage? Um, no, uh, the, the body at the beginning, before shooting, I knew it because technically it, ne it needs to be figured out before the shooting in terms of light and the camera, the lenses, and the, the movement. Mm. So yes, this is the only thing I knew. And then the other parts uh, have been discovered while editing and yeah, while editing. Mm. Carol, your film, of course, also has very close up shots of your family during the interview process. Um, but I really like sort of the juxtaposition of your fictionalized shots um, where I think the play with um, 
you know, the spaces, the color, the kind of walls that you have in your homes create this physical distance, which you were also trying to relay emotionally that is there. Um, talk me through sort of your visual treatment for your film. Yeah, I think I'm a very, uh, I'm a documentarian who plans a lot. And I like to write documentary scripts beforehand, which is, you know, very loose interpretation of events that I project that will happen or that I plan to shoot. And so for the film, everything was storyboarded, everything was planned out. Um, there were even things in the house that I had wanted to, to change in the art direction or visually change. For example, um, in the kitchen, we had a square table. So for the film, I wanted it to be circular and to mm. be a collective experience. In the bathroom, the wall was orange, which made my sister kind of look orange, uh, <laughs> almost uh, too, too tan, like a fake tan. So we had changed the walls for that. And so um, I had already come up with the concept and the scenes that we were going to shoot and intentionally worked with my cinematographer to figure out, you know, exactly how each shot would be uh, would be captured the day of um, so that it on the day of it was more like a fiction set hmm. uh, but all the concept and everything was already there and planned out before production and the fictionalized scenes um, did they come about organically or how did you sort of decide to put them in there um, I, I wanted each member of the family to have their own room and to do something that is natural to them. So for my mom, that was obviously the kitchen. For my mm. dad, that was the living room. And for my sister, um, who hadn't been home in so long, mm. I had, could only picture her in her bedroom, but um, I wanted to reserve those intimate spaces for the end. So I decided one thing that my sister does that my parents didn't know about was she smoked. Smoke. Mm. <laughs> and what space in the house would she go to do that? And I figured the bathroom. Mm. Um, so they're, it is fictionalized, but they aren't acting because they're doing exactly what they would do as, as their own selves. Did the, uh, so has the secret about the smoking finally been let loose? in the filming process or no is that still a secret my parents thought it was an oregano cigarette because that's <laughs> what we told them um I'm pretty sure that they have discovered throughout you know the process but I think it's just something that they just don't want to talk about because they don't want to bring up that tension so they're like we don't know but of course <laughs> I'm sure they do know <laughs> at yeah. this point yeah, it's so common with Indian families. I think a lot of us also hide these things. And I'm sure, I don't know. Uh, what about you? Are you still having lots of secrets with the parents, Madonna? Not at all. No, not, not at anymore. All. <laughs> <laughs> also, at the age of 35, 34, it's why we've been like uh, uh, apart for 12 years now. Now we're mm. meet, we meet as friends. So, mm. no, there's no need. <laughs> mm. Uh, it's interesting because, uh, you know, you do have, Carol, in your uh, film, these uh, gestures or like mundane tasks, kind of these everyday tasks, um, which you're, you know, like you said, your mother uh, cutting the fish or washing the bok choy, your sister taking a bath, your father lighting the incense. Um, and I feel like the distance between them is not only created in the mind, but also through these bodily sort of gestures of everydayness. Um, what, what do these like quiet, repetitive moments evoke for you uh, when you looked at them in the film? For me personally, I wanted them to represent moments where you're alone and you know your mind just wanders off. And if you catch someone in this moment, if you're lucky enough to get a glimpse, you're probably wondering, I wonder what he's praying about. I wonder what my mom is thinking about right now as her mind zones off. And I wanted to capture these moments 
for each of the characters in a very meditative state to contrast that with their interviews, which was the opposite, you know, stripped down. You can hear every, all of their thoughts in that moment mm. um, and, and better emphasize the facade that exists between them. Mm. Madonna, your, your uh, body of work is definitely the body being so representative, um, you know, and this body that sort of is growing up as a young girl in Damascus that longs for women, uh, your breasts, uh, you're feeling them being as unwanted parts of your body. And of course, the central sort of idea of you being punished for not complying with this very patriarchal, repressive society. Um, before the film, was it already part of your work where you looked at, you know, the memory that was held by your body as part of an exploration of your past? Was it something that was always there? Um... It wasn't formed in this clear way, but mm -hmm. yes, I've been working on, on the body, women and queers since four years now. So yes, this subject and these things are in my mind, but not clearly this way, like this film. They, they take different shapes, let's say. When did you realize that, you know, the body has stored so much memory within your own body? Like, how was that sort of, how did that come about? Mm. Mm. I think it started with the mental health. Uh, when, I, when I started having this kind of depression and, um, and OCD, uh, then it hits me, it hit me, uh, how, how was it in the past? And mm -hmm. then I made the link. So yeah, I think start from there. And then all my care about my body, how I like my tattoos to be, how uh, I play sports, I play a lot of sports and I, uh, so yeah, I, wa I want my body to be in a certain way that I like. So I started rethinking about how I see my body uh, and re-owning it. And that was, sorry. <laughs> All good. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, that, anyway, that started from, uh, from the mental health problems. Okay. Um, you know, both of you go really deep into your past, the past of your families, your own cultural histories. Um, I was wondering, like, what was the process like for both of you outside of being filmmakers, just being people, daughters, um, sisters? Um, what was the process like for you? Um, and also, I, want, I was wondering, because I've been playing a lot with this idea through all these films, is that when you look so far in your past, like, and think about memories, there's this blurring of lines between what is real and what is imagination? Because there's such a gap maybe in your memory. And I almost wonder like how, what was the process like for both of you going back in your past and trying to recollect things? Madonna, do you wanna talk about it? In this case, how maybe your body remembers differently from what your mind remembers? Um, well, it's interesting. I, I love these gaps <clears throat> in the memory because yeah. you fill in these gaps the way you want. You fill mm. them with emotions sometimes, you fill them with uh, unreal events that you think they're real. And it doesn't matter now if they're real or not because mm. this is the way you remember them. So filling in the gaps the way you want is something very interesting, I think. Uh, also, there's another thing that I did is to ask for the facts that happened. And even though when I ask about the facts and I, I it doesn't match my memory. Sometimes I choose the memory because mm. this is how I feel. And this is what, what's important, what left. So the feeling is the, the, what, what, what is left from the past. It's not the actual fact. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like what your body remembers and what your mind remembers is drastically different? No, I don't think so. No. Okay. Your body remembers the trauma and you, st you keep feeling it. So... Mm -hmm. as I said it doesn't matter what what actually happened happened because if, if yeah. it if you feel this way then this is the reality emotions are facts so that's it mm -hmm. Carol how, how did 
Oh, sorry. I was just going to comment. I think it's really interesting what Madonna said about how you can, you know, paint your own narrative in those memory gaps. I think it's also interesting when you dissect those memories and think why, like, this wasn't really what happened or the complete truth. And I think truth is very subjective, mm-hmm. but why did I choose to tell my gap this way? And sometimes it's just, you know, you need to convince yourself of one thing that maybe is false, but you do it for your own guilt or your own regret or your own desire to um, put some, to, to psychologically put something that's missing there. Um, and I think for no crying, as, as soon as we started to talk about our feelings and our memory gaps and how we interpreted these mm-hmm. moments, we were able to finally tie the strings together and find more of a complete picture as everyone, you know, talked about their piece of the puzzle. Um, and I think collective memory is so strong mm. because we're able to read in between the lines and read everyone's story and figure out why each person decided to choose that specific memory, that specific narrative. Um, and I think something powerful that happens when we are able to do that is sometimes we're able to go back and change that memory um, and figure out a different narrative for ourselves. Absolutely, that's uh, very well put. And I think that's what I was also trying to figure out through this film program is how can, you know, while dealing with loss and grief, how can one go back and can one go back and reimagine sort of the past and the future uh, for us, especially uh, looking at bodies of people of color, of different ethnicities. Um, So yeah, I I also think what your sister Michelle says um, in one of the scenes is that, you know, we never actually stop mourning. And that is the crux of sort of my film program, which is, you know, there is no end to grieving and uh, this idea that you that there is a linearity of um, this kind of emotion that you go from point A to point B or these supposedly seven or five stages of grief. Um, I think Michelle puts it so beautifully, um, you know, and a lot of your films have looked at this idea of grief and trauma and loss. Um, I wonder how this medium of, with this visual medium of film has helped you articulate your own voice over the years to express things maybe that were hard for you to talk about and how you've used the medium? Mm -hmm. I think when language is a barrier um, Mm. in my family, and even when language is a barrier in more metaphorical sense, like you can't find the words to describe, you know, images and sound are always universal the even the amount of time you decide to stay on a specific shot Mm -hmm. tells the viewer something do you want it to be painful do you want it to be quick do you want it to seem calming and I think film has helped me articulate what I couldn't say often or even the words I didn't have at the time like I didn't figure out the word intergenerational trauma what no crying was actually about until a film programmer wrote that word in a in a program book and I was like oh, that's what it's that's what it is I, this is what I was trying to describe hmm. and so I think film because it allows us to touch on so many art forms like music sound images art we're able to take everything and collect all the senses that we feel from this one feeling this one word this one theme and just throw it in there and create something a lot bigger than, than what we had originally had in our heads. And you've been filming from the ninth grade, is it true? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I discovered it in my uh, high school film program. And did you always want it to be a filmmaker? Or... No, <laughs> no. <laughs> I, uh, I think I wanted to be a businesswoman when I was mm. younger. And it wasn't until I dis- discovered how therapeutic filmmaking was this therapy that I never had when I was a teenager that um, made me realize how powerful storytelling was. 
but uh, I, I came into filmmaking just kind of oblivious. I thought I would, the furthest I'd go was maybe be a YouTuber <laughs> or a blogger, but um, as it turns out, I discovered something more beautiful. <laughs> Madonna, you also uh, play with other mediums. I think you paint and uh, you, of course, are an animator. How did, how does the visual or the medium of film help you to sort of um, talk about your own identity? Um, yeah, it evolved. Uh, first, I, I studied fine arts be before studying filmmaking. So I wanted to say something through art, but obviously I wasn't sure how. So it evolved. I started with paintings and then uh, video art, some video arts. Then I went to Concordia. I started animation. I started animating. And then from the animation, I jumped to the to documentary because I thought that, okay, this is where I want to be doing documentaries specifically and fiction, but not animation. I switched from animation. So I think I just evolved to the medium I love more. And it was a discovery journey. It, it wasn't clear from the beginning. And yes, I played with different mediums and I'm still open to play with other mediums uh, if the subject uh, mm. needs, but because also the subject uh, tells you how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk a bit about your relationship with Syria. I know you left in 2009, um, but you know, like you said in the film, when I left Syria, my body became my only land. It's the only thing I own. Um, have you been back since? And can you talk us through a bit about how Syria shapes your identity, if it does? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I go. I always go back. I visit. I see my parents when they're there. Uh, but the thing is that I I don't belong in there anymore. I don't. I don't have friends, they all left. And there are a few things left to do there for mm. me because I don't have a life there anymore. It's been a long time. Uh, when I was young, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been this person if I didn't grow up there. But mm. at the same time, yes, now I, I wouldn't live there anymore. But, but, uh, but um, it's... It's sad that I had this kind of oppression when I was young, but at the same time, I'm happy to go through this so I can tell what I'm telling now mm. and I can, I can be aware of things that I wouldn't be aware of if I didn't face. And saying this, I think I have a privilege now <clears throat> that I can talk about these subjects without being uh, threatened. So, and I'm happy that I faced these, these things and I'm lucky enough to leave and to be able to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Carol, you um, hadn't been back to Vietnam until 20, or had never been to Vietnam actually until 2019. Is that true? That's correct. Um, what was that like? I mean, your parents were refugees in the 1980s during the war, they left Vietnam. Um, and you obviously never been back, but been growing growing up in um, a family of Vietnamese. Uh, you obviously, I guess, were grown up while growing up had ideas of what Vietnam was, and then you went there in 2019. Was that a conflict between what you had, what people had told you about Vietnam, and then what you actually saw? And yeah, talk of me through course. that experience. <laughs> I had so many identity crises. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I had a moment where I just cried on the street because I was just like, I don't know if I belong here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, never having gone until I was 21, I had a collection of stories, 40 years old, that my parents told me about that I thought Vietnam was. And of course, you know, Vietnam is just a Google search away and I could see the city and the landscape and everything. But these stories, because they are such a vehicle for empathy. I had gone to Vietnam with kind of rose colored glasses of trying to um, discover these places that I had in my memories that my parents described to me. But of course, you know, this all, everything is gone. Mm. Um, it's a completely new city. So I had to kind of re-understand what Vietnam was 
and where my parents is Vietnam, where my memory of what Vietnam was even fit in into the picture. Um, and of course, what I thought was Vietnamese, uh, I, I didn't know if I, I was completely Vietnamese when I had come there and um, had to reevaluate what my meaning of home was and, mm. and where I fit into the world. So it was so confusing. <laughs> and I think it's confusing for many people when they return to their motherlands. Yeah, and I think you flew back right after and gave a speech at ITFA. Uh, it was in the middle of my trip. Because <laughs> <laughs> I remember hearing that opening night speech and I was like, wow, this is the first time she's gone to Vietnam. And like emotionally, it had, must have been like really hectic for you. Oh, yeah. A lot of tears. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. You know, talking about identity and sort of authentic representation of stories. I mean, both of you are filmmakers um, of ethnic backgrounds and women of color. I, I wonder if you think about, you know, whether, um, or, or, or if you have a fear um, as filmmakers of making stories that are very culturally and identity specific. And if you suddenly become like shrunk down to that uh, sort of one metric in terms of a filmmaker or is it liberating for you almost to tell these very authentic and relevant stories uh, from a voice that knows these kind of identities well enough and um, comes from you know a very strong um, perspective um, and experience um, where you know through this you can actually overturn sort of dominant narratives of maybe what it is to be a Vietnamese or what it is to be a Syrian uh, what it is to be a woman of color so wh wh where do you feel like you lie in that framework of as a filmmaker do you fear being kind of bogged down into this one like oh she only makes films of this sort or is it liberating for you Carol I think I consider myself very early on in my career right now. So I feel both. Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to change the narrative and I want to create different stories of the Asian diaspora out there now and create better representation, more diverse representation. But I also fear being categorized into only doing documentaries with talking heads or I don't consider myself uh, my documentary one with talking heads, but or just creating you know Asian stories, whatever that means to them. But um, you know, I am someone who also wants to push my craft. I want to um, explore different kinds of forms. My next film is an animation. I'm doing a fiction, so I I fear that being boxed off too, and I think that. Sometimes it's universal and inevitable, uh, regardless of your ethnicity. If you're a horror filmmaker, sometimes you get boxed mm. off into that. So I'm trying to navigate that right now um, and, and see if there's something that I can do. But for me, I just want to do everything. So I, I personally don't consider myself within that box. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps Madonna can, can answer since she has. A, a more uh, established career <laughs> uh well being uh smaller or shrunk down just because we, i'm talking about my identity my color my everything is is very problematic what, uh, a white man can talk about his experience with sex for his whole, whole life and people almost worship him Mm. So just now being a woman, a queer woman, uh, a woman of color, talking about identity, uh, about this oppression, it doesn't make me smaller or shrunk down. It makes me more courageous and mm -hmm. uh, liberated. And yes, uh, I'm, I don't want to think that I'm, I'm, I've been put in a box because I'm talking about this, just because, the, because this is a label thing. Mm. Uh, people tend to do when a queer woman, woman of color, talking about identity at the same mm. time compared with white men doing this is whoa, it's God. 
Yeah, but that's what we're like sort of like resisting and trying to, you know, overcome these sort of barriers through, and I guess you as filmmakers, I guess, and, you know, Carol, you, you, you've you talked a lot about representation and gender parity and sort of equity and equality. And do you feel like there is a movement? I mean, there's a lot of hype uh, and noise, I feel, around this. Uh, but I still feel, you know, to make such a hullabaloo when, um, there's like 50% represented filmmakers. I mean, this should be the norm. I mean, why are we still, for me, why are we still making such a big deal? How do, how do you feel about it? And I know a lot of your work goes uh, on these issues. I think that it's still very problematic. We have huge representation issues and diversity issues, depending on what country and what region, which film industry you talk about. And diversity looks different in every city, every country, every local community. Um, but I also see as a whole that we are making progress and I'm one of the generations to benefit from that progress, to grow up with um, fellowship for women and um, film festivals that are specifically focused on Asian stories. Um, so it's also very exciting to see that and to be living and entering the career, uh, entering the industry in my early career while this momentum is going on. I hope it continues and I hope it continues with good purpose, but I also see that there's a lot of um, capitalistic intentions behind these decisions, just going with a trend or thinking that people um, want to see certain faces or certain decisions being made, but just making them for that intention and not necessarily having the the people of color behind being behind their backs or behind the woman's back um i think it's also very telling city or to tell diverse stories and who those executives are, who those producers are. Um, and sometimes that and it's very putting on a face mm -hmm. to show change, but the root is still the same. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, Madonna, do you have anything to add about this root of the patriarchal industry that you work within <laughs> well not much it's a constant fight <laughs> well it's not the, only the this industry is a it's a patriarchal world it's a man world so mm. yes, it's just a part of it so it's a constant fight in every detail of the life your team was specifically you said women and queer right for this film? yes there's only one man who was feminist who was an ally who's, yes i i always i prefer working with women because mm. of because of many things, I think women are very strong and very good with what they do. Uh, and specifically, uh, DOP women are amazing. And with a DOP man, with a woman director, could be could have a, um, a conflict a bit because his male ego uh, sometimes plays role. So mm -hmm. I I prefer working with uh, a woman DOP and women in general. Uh, yeah, because uh, I'm talking about women, about myself, about my body, and this is my space and our space to talk about ourselves. Uh, there's sometimes no space for men, mm. and that's okay. <laughs> and is your uh, future work going to also be connected to similar topics, or can you tell us about what you're working on? Yeah, I'm, I'm now working on two films, a short fiction. There's also about queer community in Damascus at the beginning of the revolution, uh, shot with the same DOP of this film, it's Elsie Hajjaj, is amazing. And uh, another feature documentary, yes, you just mentioned at the beginning of the interaction, mm. uh, also shot by the same DOP, we're friends and we're good with working together. Uh, yeah, these are the main two projects that I'm working on. On the side, there is I'm working on a visuals of for a play in Switzerland and another visuals of an opera in Belfast. 
uh, but as, as films that I write and direct, yes, there is these two films. And how's the context of living in uh, Beirut and what is happening there <laughs> sort of affect your work? I don't know if it's affecting my work or it's affecting me. <laughs> Both. I think they're related. <laughs> it's not so easy, but uh, I'm well surrounded. We're a group of friends who are supportive to each other and we're creating kind of a bubble, a safe bubble for ourselves uh, because it's, it's really depressing uh, being here. So we go out to the beach, we do some small stuff, we do gatherings at home. We're a few people and yes, you can survive the city. It's a beautiful city anyway, but sadly mm -hmm. destroyed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, Carol, what's what's going on? I know you said mentioned an animation project and a feature doc. Is it following the same sort of lines of um, your work from the past or are you embracing new waters? <laughs> so um, the animated short is about that identity crisis that I had spoken about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, my feature doc follows my family as they go back to Vietnam for the first time and discover the life of their schizophrenic brother um, who had passed away. He's the brother that uh, my Your father talked about yeah. in the film. Um, so that's been a big mystery and taboo because he, he died by suicide and um, schizophrenia was even something that my family didn't understand completely uh, because mental illness is so taboo in the Vietnamese community. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, I have a fiction short going into production this fall, um, which briefly talks about the lives of an aunt and her niece as their grandma, the matriarch, is lying on her deathbed and how their lives would change after that. The feature doc with your parents, uh, is it actually your parents returning to Vietnam for the first time since, they've, since they left? Yes, since 40 wow. years. Wow. That, that's, that, that is definitely going to be another tear-jerking, emotional, new in film, huh? Well, see, it's going to take a lot of emotional <laughs> labor, too. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't see any questions from our audience. Please don't be shy. Uh, you can write them in the chat or you write them to me directly or you can come on to Zoom and ask us. Um, yeah, are there any questions? Um, I think my last question for both of you uh, is where do you find inspiration in these challenging times? Uh, Madonna, I know you live in a very challenging city, but beyond Beirut, uh, what inspires you? What keeps you going? I've never thought about, uh, about this as an inspiration, just like there are enough materials in our lives and in this world that deserves to be spoken about. So just if you look around, there are plenty of things. That's why also my first choice most of the times is a documentary mm. because there's no need for me to create fiction when there is such a huge <laughs> things happening. <laughs> Sometimes I do fictions when I cannot recreate like, like the, this queer community at the beginning of the revolution. So mm. as I said, the, the subject creates the medium. But uh, yeah, I don't think it's an inspiration. You just look around and <laughs> there's everything. You, Carol? I would agree. Um, I, I feel like there are so many stories, even though sometimes I hit the same topics, um, stories that you can tell from different dimensions and with different characters from different perspectives and different memories. Um, it's been difficult during the pandemic for sure because of quarantine, because of less socialization and less physical collaboration. Um, so often I find inspiration from non-film things to, to keep me more focused while I, I do my creative. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, ladies. I think it's really the need of the hour for stories like yours that are 
so vulnerable and you know resonate with a lot of not just women but people around the world who wish that they could be seen on screen like you and haven't found representation before of you know things that we don't talk about or are taboo so thank you so much for your work and for sharing them with us and i'm really curious about all your new work and wishing you well and good health and uh, thank you to the oyun team for hosting us and yeah, I guess we can end uh, now. <laughs> so thank you, thanks thank you. a lot and have a wonderful Sunday. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Lots of love. Bye, guys. <laughs>